Okay, um, I can see that there's a couple people still logging in um, and that's fine. We're just gonna um, take a few minutes to just go over the um, game plan for this evening. So um, what we're gonna do tonight is um, go through all about iNaturalist and just like if you've been on any others of our webinars here, um, please keep your microphones muted. Although we appear to be a rather small group here tonight, so maybe at the end, um, we can open it up for uh, questions uh, without muting um, if you want. But if you think of questions as I'm going through, please um, feel free to jot them down in the chat box and I'll stop a couple times throughout the evening and um, look at those questions and see if I can answer them. Uh, if you're having trouble with your connection, um, try turning your own video camera off and you'll just get a stronger connection um, so that you'll get me coming through and it won't be competing with you. And we will be recording this. So if for some reason you have to get off early or anything like that, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So what we're gonna do tonight, uh, using iNaturalist for wildlife identification. For those who do not know who I am, I am Christy Morley. I am the senior naturalist here at Wissican Trails. And I wanna say thank you for joining us this evening. And if you're not aware, just wanted to take a minute to talk about who we are. Um, as you can see, an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We were founded a little over 60 years ago to protect the land and water of the Wissahickon Creek. Uh, we mainly operate in Montgomery County and work with our partners in Philadelphia, where the creek goes into Philadelphia County. Um, to date, we've saved nearly 1,300 acres of land from development, and on that land is 12 nature preserves and about 24 miles of trails that are open for you to enjoy. Uh, if you are currently a supporter of, a supporter of ours, thank you. Uh, my own personal thank you. We could not do this without our supporters. Um, and if you're not currently a supporter and would like to learn more about us or see how to become a supporter, please check out our website. Uh, there's loads of information there about the work that we're doing, more than I can talk about tonight. Um, there's also interactive trail maps that you can use to figure out where to park and where to access the trails um, closest to where you might live. So please take a look at our website and I encourage you to become a supporter if you're not already. So uh, just really quickly do a little bit of an outline here for our plan tonight. So I'm gonna talk kind of sort of forest main sections. Um, what is iNaturalist? Why should you use it? Um, how to use it? And then how it works. And I know that it seems maybe a little odd that I'm talking about the how it works after the how to use it, um, but the how it works is a little bit more technical, sort of. And um, I find it easier to explain to people how to use it first and let them see that and then explain sort of the behind the scenes of how it's actually working. And um, so that you come away sort of with a full picture of the um, program and the, how you can use it. And then lastly, we're gonna wrap up with um, a couple of opportunities that you have um, that you can go out and do iNaturalist on your own and um, sometimes with staff from Wissick and Trails. And we'll talk about that um, at the end. So those ways that you can actually get out in the field and, and contribute to collecting information. So what is it? Well, it's, you can see here, it's these three basic things, an online social network to share biodiversity information, a crowdsourced species identification system, and an organism re occurrence recording tool. And that all sounds very formal, I know. Um, those are the official explanations from the iNaturalist website. And we're gonna break all of this down and go through sort of each component of this um, throughout the evening. And you're gonna see how all of these things kind of come together um, behind the scenes so that it, you know, this is what iNaturalist does. Uh, in order to use iNaturalist, you need to set up an account uh, if you haven't already. Don't worry if you don't have one now, you will not need it for this program tonight. Um, but once we're done, you can go, uh, download from the App Store or Google Play. And I find the easiest to do is actually set up the account on the computer um, through the, the iNaturalist website. And then once you download the app onto your phone, you can sign in with that same account information. And then your observations will sync between your mobile device and the web versions. And we're gonna talk about both of those as we go through um, and how to use them and some of the key functional differences between them um, and why you really do wanna play uh, around with both of them, um, both you know the mobile sites and the, the actual website. Um, the website has a lot more functionality and you'll see that as we go through. 
Uh, if you're looking for the app on the App Store, it, it's this green bird thing uh, is the right one. That's the, the uh, what the app looks like, their icon. Um, just real quick, I wanted to touch on the history of iNaturalist. You can see it was started in 2008 as a, a master's project for somebody that was at UC Berkeley School of Information. And you can see the, the history um, of it there. Now it is jointly hosted by the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. And um, it's relatively new. And I would say it's probably, you know, been in the last four to five years, maybe, that I feel like it's really come into its own. Um, I started using it before that and it didn't work as well as it works now. And part of that is because so many more people are using it and putting information into it that the machine learning and the AI part of it that helps us learn to identify things is so much better than it was when it first started. Um, so if you haven't used it yet, you're coming in at a really good time because it's a very functional product and really easy to use. Um, three things that you should know about it. Um, it is global in coverage. So if you travel, uh, hopefully <laughs> when we can all travel again, when, if you travel, you can use this around the globe and use it to um, you know, record pictures of birds or plants or salamanders or whatever that you see in your journeys around the world. Um, it is free, all parts of it, all the time, uh, absolutely available for use. Um, there are educator resources on their website as well. So if you are a teacher or involved in homeschooling, um, there are resources online that can help you. Uh, and if you want more information on that, please feel free to reach out to me as well, because um, I'm happy to sort of bring this to classrooms if we can. Um, and last but not least, it is open access. So if you're a programmer um, and are interested in helping from that perspective, you absolutely can. And there's information on the website um, about how to get involved from that perspective. So one of the things that I mentioned, um, it's function of iNaturalist is sharing biodiversity information. And this is an image from a presentation that the folks at iNaturalist actually put together. And I continue to use it because I think it really, perfectly sums up why having an understanding of what's out there can be important. And that's the quote at the bottom. We can't protect and manage what we don't know. And this picture you can see from all these little arrows, um, even if you don't know this and can't identify these plants, there are all of these different plants in this picture. Um, sunglasses are in here for scale. So these plants are just starting to grow, just haven't broken out of the ground. And we can use iNaturalist to identify that they all exist and maybe this patch of meadow, maybe it's a restored meadow, um, an old farm field, that kind of thing. And if we weren't aware that they're there, um, we wouldn't be able to save them and, and continue to protect them and encourage other things that might use that environment to grow as well. And so this sharing of this biodiversity information allows researchers and land managers like us here at Wissican Trails to use that data to inform research and decision-making about what happens on that land. So that's why it's really important. Observations are the lifeblood of iNaturalists, and you'll hear me talk about observations over and over and over tonight. Um, an observation is simply a way of recording an encounter with an individual organism at a particular time and location. And so you can see here, this is from my um, iNaturalist account, just some of my observations, a screenshot. Um, so this is a common chaffinch seen September 1st, 2018 in Sweden. So that gives you, that's an observation. It's a thing, an organism, at a time and a place. And all of that information is important when you make an observation. And something to keep in mind is that Repeated observations of the same species are completely acceptable. Um, don't think you only have to add something once. It's important to know if you saw this same species at another location or another date, um, even if that's the, the same location you saw it the first time. Maybe you see it in January and you see it in March. And that information is important. So multiple observations of the same species um, or organism are encouraged. Um, at, especially if they're at different places uh, and different times of the year. The elements in a, of an observation, this is um, a screenshot from, again, from my iNaturalist account that shows um, 
one particular observation, this broad-headed sharpshooter. So you can see, um, in order to make an observation, you really do need all of the following. You need the who, so you need the iNaturalist account to be able to do it. You need to know when you saw it. You need to know where you saw it. It will make the map for you. Um, or you can you know, pick a point on a map. Uh, you'll see that in, as we go through. Um, you need to know where you saw it. You have to have evidence of what you saw. And for iNaturalist, that evidence means a picture or a sound recording. Um, as of right now, iNaturalist doesn't take videos, but you can always, you know, if you have a video of something, you can always um, capture a screenshot from that and upload that picture um, or a sound file. So you actually have to have some kind of evidence. You, unlike eBird, for those on the call who might have used eBird in the past or sort of be familiar with it, eBird relies on birders putting in their observations of the birds they saw or heard, but they don't require you to have pictures or sound files. It's, it's literally just a checklist if you don't have those things. In iNaturalist, you have to have a picture or a sound file um, to create that evidence. And then you need to know what you saw. And we're gonna talk about how to do that, um, but you, you're using basically the systems AI a lot of times to help you, that artificial intelligence in the background to help you understand what you saw and learn what you saw. Um, and it works very well. Sometimes it's not perfect, but it does actually work really well um, for a lot of the organisms that, that we have. You can add details and notes to things. Um, if you saw it performing a specific behavior, you can add that in the comments. Um, those kinds of things, perfectly acceptable. You can add a lot of information on, like if it's a male or a female, if you can tell the difference. Um, if it's a juvenile or an adult, again, if you can tell the difference, there's lots of you know, information that you can put in here. We're gonna talk about community ID as we move forward, so don't worry about that right now, but this is actually a very important part of iNaturalist, but we're gonna spend a lot more time on that um, in a few minutes. And then we're also gonna talk more uh, at the end about projects and um, each observation, if it's been added to a project, it will show it in the, in the observations in this project list down here. So all of those things, but it's really the who, when, where, the evidence and then the identification um, that create that observation. So the other thing, oh, one thing I will say here, observations need to be attached to what iNaturalist calls the tree of life. So not rocks, not trash, um, you know, not buildings, those kinds of things. We're talking about living creatures, plants, organisms um, in the environment and in a habitat. Um, and it is preferred that they're wild animals, plants. Um, so if you, even if you plant native plants in your garden, in your backyard, you can iNaturalist those plants, but you need to put in that they're cultivated, um, not that, this, that they're not wild. And there's a checkbox basically that you can do when you put something in and say whether it's cultivated or not. Uh, likewise, we really shouldn't be iNaturalist saying pictures of animals from a zoo, for example, um, because they're captive animals and we're really trying to understand what's going on in the natural habitats around us as best we can. So again, you can add them, excuse me, but you should um, designate them as being captive kinds of things um, and not wild living creatures. But what you can do if you don't have the species itself, but you have evidence of the species, you can add that. So things like bear tracks or any kind of animal tracks that are identifiable, like deer, for example, or raccoons. Um, signs of a beaver. Uh, these are, you know, you see a tree like this, or you see even if the top has fallen and this pointy bottom, you know a beaver has been there. And that counts as evidence of the species. Um, same with shed antlers. And sometimes antlers can be identified to species, sometimes they may not be able to be, um, but you know, it, it's a start. And so you can absolutely use that as um, evidence of the species and certainly put that into iNaturalist and make an observation about that. One thing that can be really helpful for, for antlers, um, for tracks of any kind, is to throw something down in the picture that's for scale. So 
Um, maybe you have a pocket notebook that you keep with you and you can put that in the picture because you know what the size of that is. And so you can get an idea of the relative size of the tracks. For example, when you're trying to have other people help you identify it. Um, some tracks look very similar to others. And so having multiple pictures, having something for scale can be really useful. Um, again, a lot of things can be identified if you don't have it, but if you think about it and have an opportunity to do that, sometimes even having your own foot in a picture can help um, create that sense of scale so that uh, it makes it easier to identify something like a track. So why use iNaturalist? Well, at its most basic, and we're gonna talk about that, how this actually happens in a second, iNaturalist can help you identify something you saw. So you're out on a walk, you see a flower on the side of the trail that you have no idea what it is, you take a picture of it, you put it in iNaturalist, and it can help you identify it. So then we, you start to learn um, the actual species of things that are in your environment. Uh, maybe there's something in the area that you're really interested in or maybe you're traveling to a new area and you want to find out what's being seen in that area well you can use iNaturalist to help you figure that out so this is a screenshot from the iNaturalist um, page looking at observations and all of these tiny little blue yellow blue green pink dots are all observations that have been made right around the Ambler headquarters of was Hicken Trails and so you can see there's a lot of, of things going on out there, lots of people making observations. So you can click on each one of these little icons, the colored tabs, and it will pop up what that actual observation is and where it was made and when it was seen. So you can get an idea of what's going on in an area um, just you know, by perusing these kinds of maps, give you a sense of what's happening. And last but not least, um, and this is a reason that's you know, more invisible to a lot of us that are in the field using iNaturalist, it really is contributing to research. Um, this is from the website, the iNaturalist website, and it's, you know, a search, re search return list of 765 articles that have been published in scientific journals using information from iNaturalist. And there are a lot of researchers out there using iNaturalist um, and, you know, it is extraordinarily useful. And even though we're not running research projects that we're gonna publish like this, we're running projects in the background that are helping us understand better what is on our preserves and what's using the habitats that we have protected so far. And a way to do that is through projects. And there's lots of different ways to do projects. Um, most of you will contribute to projects Somewhere down the road, you may have an opportunity to set one up, but for the most part, just understanding that a project is literally just a way to pull observations from multiple observers. That's all it is. And they can be specific events, like the City Nature Challenge, we're gonna talk more about at, at the end. They can be subject-based, like this Spotted Lanternfly project that's going on now in the US. Um, they're actually looking for uh, evidence of what's eating spotted lanternflies. So if you see birds eating spotted lanternflies, try to get a picture. If you see um, a spotted lanternfly caught in a spider web, and you know, particularly if the spider's shown any uh, ability to be able to eat the spotted lanternfly, um, that kind of observation can go into this project. And they can also be location-based. We have, I have a number of location-based projects running in the background for um, all of the preserves that we're monitoring and managing. So there's a preserve for crossways, or a project for crossways, there's a project for army trial, there's a project for literally every single preserve. And this is just scraping any observation that comes in, that's within that geographic boundary that I've set up. And even though we haven't gotten into the how to use section yet, I want to point out that in the app on, on your phone, you can search for projects that are nearby your location when you're out in the field. Um, and that can sometimes help you to know like what you might want to be looking for when you're out there or know that, um, hey, these projects are, are operating here and I want to make sure I put my observations in them. Um, 
The website, I will say, is a lot easier to use for projects, um, but I find that it can help to take a screenshot of the projects list that comes up when I'm using the mobile app, and then I can refer to it later on in the website. And the projects work a couple of different ways. Um, the ones that I have set up, like the one at Crossways or Armitrout, works in the background and just automatically collects the data that is based on the parameters that I've set up. And a lot of other projects work like that as well. The City Nature Challenge works the same way. Um, it is capturing information for a specific geographic area that's defined in iNaturalist and a specific date range. Uh, and, you know, I, the City Nature Challenge is four days long. So anything in that geographic area in that period of time will be automatically captured in um, a city's results. So uh, you don't have to do anything. Other projects, you actually have to put your observation in. Um, this is what happens with a spotted lanternfly predation. Um, if you just put a picture of a spotted lanternfly in iNaturalist, the project isn't going to know that you're putting in a picture of something eating it, for example. So you need to um, specify that you want it to be included in this project. And you, you usually need to read the rules of the project to make sure that you're putting in the right information. Um, sometimes researchers, researchers will reach out to you after the fact um, and ask you to submit an observation to their project because they've, they've like maybe they're searching, they're looking for um, butterfly caterpillars and they notice that you have, you know, a bunch of pictures of butterfly caterpillars, but their project isn't set up to automatically um, add them. And they'll see your observations and they'll send you an email through the, app, through the website of iNaturalist and say, hey, I saw you had these observations of butterfly caterpillars. Can you please add them to my project? And you just have to go in and do a pick list, uh, you know, checklist and from that project and add them. And it's really simple. And it's, I've had that happen to me a couple of times. And it's really nice, I think, to know that researchers are actually using the data um, and, and that there are people working behind the scenes to make sure that they have all the data that they need for a project, for example. So um, I think that's really cool. And it kind of just brings back that whole community aspect of it. Um, the whole idea is sharing uh, the knowledge about what's out there and what we're seeing. So um, I just wanted to show you here uh, on the projects I said I have set up in the background. Um, so you can join these projects, but you don't have to. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in the, on the website. Um, but for some reason, right now, these aren't working so that you can see that your data is added. But no, in fact, it is. I can for sure see it. Um, I'm showing you the summary of 2019 because of COVID. There were not a lot of observations for 2020. So this is the better data to look at some of these um, kinds of observations. But you can see here, um, here's the number of the preserves that I have projects set up at, uh, the number of observations versus the number of species. And the difference is basically some, you know, some things may be looking at the same species over and over and over again, for example. Um, and then the number of observers that participated in collecting those observations. Um, by far the highest taxon that we see results for is insects, um, which is actually makes a lot of sense. Birds, for example, um, there's not there's there's a fair amount of them in there, but there um, a lot of people are out there with their phones, and so it's much harder to get pictures of birds or mammals um, with phones. So iNaturalist is really heavy on things like insects and plants and fungi. Uh, because they're just easier to take pictures of with your phone. But that being said, if you have something besides your phone that you're willing to take out into the field with you, so if you have any kind of uh, digital camera, that's even small point and shoot cameras can often zoom much better than um, a, t a cell phone can, for example. So anything like that that can help you um, you know, get a broader range of pictures, uh, maybe be able to capture some birds or some mammals or things like that, that typically, you know, they're gonna run away from you or fly away from you. Um, so they're a lot harder to capture than plants, for example. So again, if you have any other kind of camera besides a phone, um, I encourage you to use that when you're trying to do uh, iNaturalist observations. Obviously, you're not gonna get the immediate gratification of 
uploading something right away in the field and being able to identify it. Um, but you certainly will be able to identify it later when you upload the picture through the website. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that tonight uh, because that is a really good way of being able to one batch upload things and then also um, use things that aren't your cell phone. Um, oh, and then lastly, the number of people that submitted more than four, five observations um, was very small. And the people that submitted more than 10 was really small. So um, this is something that for 2021 and beyond, I love to see us get these numbers up. I'd like to see us target some of these other preserves like Willow Lake or PZAC um, that don't get as much um, coverage. Floor mills and crossways tend to get a lot of coverage because that's where staff is a lot of times from Wissican trails. So, you know, we need people out on some of the other preserves to help us collect some of that information um, as well. You know, challenge you. Um, how many observations can you make in a year um, from Wissican trails properties and challenge yourself to, to stretch that. Um, number a little bit. All right, I'm going to stop here for questions really quick. Um, I didn't see any popping up. I don't see any in the chat. So, okay, I'm going to keep going. And um, again, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat box and I'll catch them at the next stopping point. So, I'm going to start with how to use it uh, in terms of adding an observation from a mobile um, phone. So iPhone, Android phones. You've got the app downloaded, you've signed in to the app using your sign in, your email password that you set up um, on the website. And um, what you see when you open the iNaturalist app is um, a list of your observations that are in there. Um, you can, they have really cool graphics of your year in review, um, which is really kind of cool, you know, when you get to the end of the year to be able to do that. Um, and you'll see a bunch of icons down at the bottom of the screen um, and explore. This is where I think you can look for projects. You can look at what other sightings have been made in the area around where you are. Um, general activity things, if people have emailed you, commented to you, you'll see like an icon here. Um, Observe is a camera icon. We'll get to that in a second. This just is me. So that's, you know, your account. And then there's further options um, with the three dots at the end. So you're in the field, you have something in front of you that you want to put in as an observation. So you open the app and you click observe. And when you do that, what will happen is your camera will automatically open. You have to give the camera permission to do that the first time you use the app, but I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with that kind of option. But literally, if it'll just say, you know, I want to use your camera and you say yes, and I want to use your photo roll and you'll say yes, and it'll be fine. And then the next time you do it, um, when you click that observation button, your camera will automatically open. So you can either take a picture from within the app, you just use a green button to take the picture, or you can click on the photo icons down at the bottom here and go to your camera roll and select a picture. So I've done that here for the next screenshot. I selected this caterpillar picture out of my camera roll and um, it does give you an option to retake. So if for some reason you picked the wrong picture or you use the app to take the picture and you don't like it, it's not in focus, whatever, you can retake it and start over again. Um, but if everything's good and you're happy with this picture, you can click next. Before I do that, I want to make a comment. You can upload multiple pictures, but you need to remember that you want to only upload multiple pictures of the same organism. So if I had two or three different pictures of this same caterpillar from different angles, maybe one's closer up, one's further away, something like that, um, I could upload more than one picture. But what you don't want to do, if you've been out in the field and say you have seven pictures of different flowers, you don't want to go in and pick all seven of those and upload them right now. You need to do each one as a separate observation. So you'll need to do the same thing. You'll hit the observe button, you'll go to your camera roll, you'll select that picture, you'll finish the rest of the process that we're going to talk about, and then you go back and you'll do the next one. And 
if you've been out in the field for a long time and you have a lot of photos that you haven't been uploading as you've been going along, you can end up with a massive amount of photos at the end of a day, for example. And that's where sometimes using the website can be a lot easier. And I'll show you that um, in a couple minutes. But just know you can upload multiple pictures, but just make sure that for each observation, it's only that one organism that you're uploading a picture for. And then once you upload it, you'll get to, when you hit this next screen, you'll get a screen that looks like this. And it'll show you the picture or pictures that you have of that organism. You'll see this blank, what did you see? You have an area to add notes. It shows you the date, the place, um, some other information. Here's the captive versus cultivated. And this was not a captive or cultivated situation. Um, uh, it was, the caterpillar was natural, the plants were not. This was a, a caterpillar on fennel in my herb garden. And the butterflies laid it, eggs there themselves, the caterpillars grew. Um, I just planted the plants, but this organism is wild. So, and then any projects, here you can look for projects to attach it to uh, if you want, um, or, and you don't have to do anything with that at this point, you can just leave it blank. So you get this, and then you, so now you wanna know, well, what did I see? So you can click this um, section. It's not really a button, but you just kind of click in this, what do you see area, and you'll get a list. And you'll get a list that looks something like this. Um, often there'll be a genus at the top, and they'll say, we're pretty sure it's in this genus. And then they'll give you the top 10 species suggestions. You can also at this point type in a species by name if you know what it is, um, and you can just start typing it in. I have to say that the machine learning and the artificial intelligence behind this works really, really well. And most of the time it is spot on. If your picture is halfway decent and pretty good focus, um, it's fairly good at picking things out. And if what you saw is not the top selection, I can almost guarantee most of the time it will be in the top five. Again, as long as your picture's good, it's in focus, you know, those kinds of things are important. Um, in this case, I know that this is not an Anna Swallowtail because we don't have them in our area, um, but you can click these little information buttons and you'll see, iNaturalist says, it may be hard to see on the screen here, but it says visually similar at the bottom, and it, or it says visually similar seen nearby. And you can use those clues to sort of help you narrow things down. Um, you can click on this little information button. It will take you out to the internet to look at um, other observations that people have made of that species. So if you're in the field and you don't want to use mobile data, that's not something that you want to be doing a lot. But if you're back in your house and you're just uploading the pictures from your phone that you took during the day uh, because you're on your Wi-Fi now, then certainly you can use that um, information button to go look. And oftentimes seeing the pictures that other people have put in iNaturalist about an observation or about a species can help you say, yeah, okay, I know that's what this is. Um, iNaturalist was a little, probably a little bit confused here because this was a caterpillar and not the actual butterfly. And these caterpillars look very similar. So I know this was a black swallowtail. So I click that. And then I get now the species says black swallowtail, all the same information is right and everything looks good. Now I can press the share button and then it goes back to my observation screen. And now that observation is at the top of the list. It's in the system. And now we're just gonna wait for the community to confirm the identification. If you don't know what the species is that you took a picture of, we're gonna talk about that. So don't panic if you don't know what it is. Um, you don't have to know. And there's um, ways that you can still enter an observation, even if you're not sure what the identification should be. And that's where the community part of it comes in to help get it right, so to speak. So don't panic if you don't know what it, what it is. Um, you will learn how to make that work uh, as you're going through. And one thing that I do want to mention really quick is um, if you're going to be participating in this, if you don't already have an account, um, consider, you'll see my uh, 
profile when we go into the website, but consider this is my username here. So it's a rough approximation of my name. Um, a lot of people put in, you know, uh, a username of Bluebell123. And when we're, as an organization, we want to try to recognize the volunteers that are helping us collect iNaturalist information. So if you have sort of a funny username, um, consider making a profile that has your real name in it. Or if you don't have a, a username yet, create a username that's a, you know, a reasonable approximation of your name so that I might know, be able to know who you are. Uh, because we would like to try to recognize people that are helping us. And this really is sort of a volunteer project for us. So if you're working on it, um, you know, you can submit hours to us and get credit for volunteer time. If you need credit for, you know, some jobs, like want people to volunteer and stuff like that. So uh, if you're doing this and, and want credit for that, please reach out to me um, and we can, you know, walk through the steps of making that happen. Some phone settings to keep in mind. Um, this is my setting screen on an iPhone. I know Android phone might look a little bit different, but the principle's the same. So, um, you know, it will be a lot easier to make observations in the field if you let the, make sure that your photo app is set up so that it tags the location, like it builds the location into the information about the photo. Um, because then iNaturalist uses that to know where you are when you took that picture. Um, let your phone geotag your photos, you know, let your phone use lo your location when you're using the app because that will help it know that something like if you're looking up an, uh, an, an, an organism that's seen nearby, it needs to know where you are to be able to show you that. And that can be really, really useful to narrow down um, what you've seen. So anything you can do to help iNaturalist do that. And in order to make that happen, you do have to let your phone use cellular data. Now, if you don't wanna do that, you can do all of this when you get home over your Wi-Fi. Um, the, the phone geotagging is separate, so hopefully you've set up your phone app to do that, and it's already in the pictures. And then iNaturalist will read that when you import those pictures into the app. So you don't have to worry about having to use cellular data when you're in the field. You can absolutely use iNaturalist. Um, just take pictures when you're out there and do it all when you get home. Or you can just upload it all to the computer, which is what we'll do next. So there's you know, a couple of things that you can do to make that work a little bit easier. That's all I'm saying. Um, I personally find it easier sometimes to just focus on taking the photos in the field and worry about uploading them when I get home. Uh, unless there's something that I really don't know what it is and I'm really, really, really curious and then I want to see right away what iNaturalist says it might be. Um, and that's usually when I'll upload it in the field. But most of the time, I just wait until I get home. So this is a screenshot of the iNaturalist website and we are actually going to go to the website. So I need to stop sharing this screen. And... I need to share a different screen. Okay. Hopefully you can all see the webpage of iNaturalist. That's my account. And if you can't, can somebody unmute themselves and tell me that you can't see this page? Okay. I can see the page. Thank you. Um, so there, there is so much information. Now, a lot of this information is in the app. Some of it's not. And so um, that's why I really encourage you to spend time sort of exploring both. And I'm not going into all the, you know, the details of what's in the app um, for stuff because a lot of times I find I don't need that. I literally use the app to upload a photo from my camera roll. And that's about all I do. If I'm going to do anything else, I usually do it in the website just because it's easier for me anyway. Um, I can't stand looking at, you know, pages on my phone that are really tiny. And so I'd much rather just work on my, my screen on my desktop computer. But what you do when you sign in, um, you'll get sort of to your home page. And this will have observations. It'll have notes from iNaturalist here. Your City Nature Challenge is coming up, so they're making some changes to things. Um, not anything that we really need to be concerned about, but just letting people know that 
They know that there's going to be a ton of stuff uploaded to iNaturalist during this time. So certain functions might not work very well um, for certain people. And usually that relates to people who have projects running who want to download observations. It may take longer. But you can see, you know, you'll get information about observations that you've made. There is a community forum, so you can ask questions. Um, you know, you can read about issues, things like that. You can create a profile. Um, so I have a simple profile here. Um, you know, my name, my title, when I've joined, uh, when, you know, that's all I am. You can follow people. So if you have friends, you can, you know, sort of create your own challenges. You can view your observations on a map um, as well as a, you know, a list. Um, this just shows you what they are. This is actually a really cool system though, because you can zoom in. And so here I was in Texas and I can now redo the search in map. And so now it'll show me these observations um, that were made uh, when I was in Texas. And you can see when I scroll over one of these, okay, my computer's a little slow. Normally the observation itself pops up. And that's the same as those icons on the main map work um, that you can like scroll over them and you'll see um, what the observation was. So these are mine. Um, you can then go back here for a second, get out of this. Um, back to my homepage. So that's the observations page. You can edit observations. Um, you can view things on a calendar. It'll show you highlight dates when you uploaded things. Um, you can have favorites. I haven't had favorites. You can, it'll, it will automatically create a life list for you. So every time you add something new that you've never seen before, it'll create this life list. You can, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do with this. You can keep a journal. Um, I haven't posted anything here, but you can do that if you wanted to write, you know, about your outing, um, and associate it with a date and a location, you can do that and then projects. And so my page for projects look crazy because I'm running them. So a lot of these are things that I've set up, but for example, I can show you here's the Crossways Preserve and here's where you could go to this page and you could join this. If you hadn't already joined, it would say join um, in that um, box. And then you could just click it and you would be joined to that project. And so this is total. Um, all of the observations that have been made at Crossways, all of the species, uh, the number of observers that have participated. And you can see, um, you know, you can break it out, like who's the most observations, who's the most species, all of that kind of stuff. And so you can see the information about all of the projects. Um, some of these other ones, like um, fireflies of the uh, US and Canada, this is one that you have to um, add stuff too because they want to make sure that you're adding the right things um, and usually what you do is you just go into this read more section and it'll tell you here um, here's the criteria that it must meet to be added to this project and then when you are in your observation you just click that you want it to go to a project and you search for this project and um, just and it will add it so there's a number of projects like that, like City Nature Challenge, Spotted Lanternfly, Fireflies that I'm like a member of um, because I've put observations in. So the wonderful thing about the website is that you can batch upload things. So like I said, in the phone, you have to do each observation once. So you have to go back to your main screen, if you will, and then you have to click observe and then you have to go find a photo and then you have to upload it and ID it and share it and then start over again for your next one. With the website, it's really cool because you can batch upload things. And so I have some photos that I have somewhere. Where are they? Nope, they're on my desktop. Where's the folder? Oh, photos for iNaturalist. Okay, so I, I honestly don't know if you guys can see my screen in terms of my collecting files, but I'm just going to the folder where all my files are. I am going to shift A to collect all of them, and then I'm going to hit open. 
and it's going to upload all of these observations. So it's going to upload my pictures. And then for each one, it's going to give me this drop down of species name. This is equivalent to the what did you see box on the app. Um, it's picking up the date. It's not picking up the location because unfortunately, my main camera, my non phone camera does not GPS tag my photos. But I'm going to show you how you can add this. Um, and so you've got all these images here. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of tricks here. So there are a couple of these that are the same, same species, the same individual, slightly different angles to make it easier to identify. So um, what you can do is literally drag these two together. So I'm going to click on this one, I'm going to drag it over to this one, and now I have one of two. So this, this organism has two images. This insect, oops, this, sorry. Yes, you can look at the full size photo if you want as well. This in, insect and this insect are actually the same. Um, they were on two different perches, they flew you know, back and forth. So I can now make that one of two. Um, I think of another one. Oh yes, this one, this inchworm are the same. So I'm gonna put those two together and this bird are the same. So now I've now I went from 16 to 12 observations because I consolidated pictures. What you can do, um, I'm just double checking these pictures. Okay, I'm going to start with the second one in here up on the top because this this pileated woodpecker. This is from a different location than all the rest of the images. So I'm going to click into the location box and it's going to give me a map. You can actually type and search for a location. I don't know that. Oh, let's try. Um, Oh, look, there it is. Armantrout Preserve, Beale Road. Perfect. Now, I'll, you can make this circle smaller. You can move it to say, I saw it exactly right here. <laughs> and that's fine. Um, and Or you can just sort of leave it, okay, it was Armantrout Preserve. That's good enough. I know that it was over here. I'm going to make this circle a little smaller. Um, I know it was over here, that's where I took the picture. And then you just click update observation. So now it has that geotag built into it. And I'm gonna click species name and it's gonna give me a list of suggestions and top suggestion, pileated woodpecker. So, yep, that's good. Now, for the rest of these, these were all from our Will Lake Preserve. So, sorry. I'm going to control and then click on each one of these. So you can see the green highlights around each box. And then I'm gonna go over here to the left where it says edit, multi see I'm editing 11 observations and I'm gonna go into the location and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna search for Willow Lake Farm Preserve, even though I can't spell. And for this one, I'm not going to break down each specific location. I'm just going to center it over Willow Lake and I'm going to say that's where I saw them. And so now every single one of those is updated with the location. And then I can go through and identify species. So this is indeed a blue headed vireo. That is a hermit thrush. This is a greater bee fly. These guys are absolutely hysterical. They have this long beak-like thing in the front. It's not a stinger. It's what they use to get nectar out of flowers. They look like a bee. They're actually a fly. They actually lay their eggs in native bees' nests. Um, and so they're kind of a parasite. But when they fly, they're really small. And when they fly, they just look absolutely hysterical because they're just this fuzzy little thing um, hovering over flowers. Uh, I'm going to Skip a couple of these. Actually, let's go to this one for a second. Um, okay, this is one I don't know what this is. Um, so I'm going to take iNaturalist up on the fact that it's probably a nomad bee. 
And this is where you have a couple of choices. And we're going to talk more about this in a slide in a second. But you can just pick the genus level, or you could pick their top suggestion. And, and this is also where you can use this view button. So this view button will take you to another web page, and you'll be able to see that particular species and the details about it. For me, for this one, because I don't know what this is, I'm going to go with the genus. And hopefully somebody that knows native bees will be able to help me with that identification. This one is another native bee, and I do know what this one is because I've seen it several times and I have several other observations of that. Likewise with this one as well. Um, it's a golden sweat bee. This, both of these two observations, actually all three of these observations that we just did, I could duplicate this. So um, this observation actually counts as two. It counts for the flower that they're on and it counts for the bee itself. So I'm just gonna do one of these right now. I'm gonna duplicate this one. And now I have a blank species name. And this is only giving me the bee names. So I'm gonna start typing. I know this was an Eastern red bud. There it is. So now I've observed the bee and I've observed the tree that it's on and the flowers that it's nectaring from. And I could do the same for this one and the one that's on the dandelion as well. So keep that in mind. Um, sometimes it's helpful to remind yourself to take a picture of the flower itself without the bee on it or without the insect on it. Again, just to remind yourself that it's a separate observation, but you don't have to. You can do it, um, you know, duplicating the same photo and it counts for two observations. Uh, this one should be pretty straightforward. Let's see. Oh. Okay, it's a yellow rump warbler. I know that because I saw it. It's not magnolia. This one should be a ruby crown kinglet. Yep. Um, okay, this one, this one actually really excited me. I looked this up earlier because I wanted to know what it was because this is a bee I've never seen before. But I did some of the digging with the viewing and looking at the other um, website, and it is a spring beauty miner. So I'm gonna. Pick that and you'll notice here it gives me both the plant, the Virginia Spring Beauty, and the bee. So I can duplicate this as well. Um, so you just go up here and hit duplicate and now I'm going to put this in as the plant. And there we go. So it counts for both. Uh, one that I didn't do here, okay, this weird insect. Um, I do not know what this is and see here, iNaturalist doesn't either. So it gives you some choices. Um, I don't know that I like any of these choices from what I can see here. And this is one I'm going to do a little bit more digging on. So for right now, I'm going to take this out of the mix um, just because I don't want to update it without some kind of guess as to what it is. And then this one. It's, this is an inchworm. I am going to show you these pictures. So this is like the master of camouflage here. But this that my cursor is on is an inchworm. And it's also here. And you can, iNaturalist didn't like this when I looked up. Yeah, see, it wants, it keeps telling me it's a katydid or a grasshopper. And I know it's not. I know it's a caterpillar. So even though I might not know what kind of caterpillar it is, I can do something like this. I can type in caterpillar. And most of the caterpillars that we're going to see in the wild are butterfly or moth caterpillars. So I can literally call it, just click that. And that would be good enough to make this observation. I know just because of doing this job and knowing a little bit about caterpillars of moths and butterflies that the ones that look like inchworms that do this, you know, hitch up, make a loop and kind of stretch themselves out and walk are part of the family of geometer moths. Oops. Nope. -E. I can't spell today. Hold on one second. G-E-O-M-E. So yes, 
I know, so these geometer moths are an option. So I'm gonna put it in like that because I think that's gonna get somebody to a closer observation. But you absolutely could put it in as butterfly and moth caterpillar. And um, hopefully somebody would identify that as well. So now we've got locations, dates, and what we believe are the proper species for all of these photos. And so now we just submit. And it's going to save them all. And then it's going to take you back to your main observation page. And you're going to see all of them in the list. And now you can see them all in the list. And they have this needs ID, which we're going to talk about um, in a second. So that's how you get things in at the website. And this is one of the things that I absolutely love about using the website because it's just so much easier to sort of manipulate a batch of things um, when you have a lot of photos to deal with. So that's all we're going to do with um, the website. So I'm going to, but I'm seeing some questions here. So before I leave the questions, um, let me, let me, before I leave the website, let me see. Um, Okay, uh, I am gonna hold on these questions for just a second um, because some of them we're gonna answer as we go through. So let's just hold on these for a second. I don't think there's anything absolutely critical here to the website. So I'm gonna take us back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so I said we we're going to talk about this. What if I'm not sure what I saw? And you kind of saw a little bit of this as we were um, doing those observations because I some of those things I literally had no idea what they were. And I had a better idea for this because I'd only looked at them in iNaturalist before and saw their suggestions. So um, a lot of times there's things I take pictures of, specifically insects, um, that I have no idea what I've, what I've seen. And it's only when I put it into iNaturalist that I can get any kind of a clue. So if you're not sure what you saw, you'll usually see two different kinds of approaches. Um, when you pick, see a, like a look up a species or what did I see, you'll see that we're not confident enough to make a recommendations, but here's our top 10 suggestions, or we're pretty sure that it's in this genus and here's our top 10 species suggestions. So the one on the right where you know we're pretty sure and it's these are the top 10 species, iNaturalist is obviously much more confident. The other one, it's really not sure. And usually that's because, well, there can be a couple of reasons. One, the picture's not good enough. There's not enough details in the picture to separate one species from another. Excuse me. Um, or you just stumped it, like you saw. I was I had a picture of a caterpillar and it kept trying to tell me it was a grasshopper or, you know, a katydid, which I knew it was not. So most that, that happens to me very, very rarely. Usually I just get this, we're not confident and it's, it's at least close. It's, this is one I uploaded a while ago that I still don't think has been identified. Um, and it's, you know, most of these choices that it's giving me are flies, which is what this is. It's a fly. I just don't know which one. Um, so Upload it anyway, give it the highest level ID that you can give it. So if you only know that it's a bird, if you only know that it's an insect, if you know that it's a butterfly, but you don't know what kind of butterfly, just put it in as a butterfly. Um, and it'll, it'll go to that higher level order or family, and that's fine. The community aspect of it will work to get it to the species level. So um, you can, you know, have a level of confidence um, with any kinds of things. If it's a mammal, if it's a mushroom, mushrooms are really hard to identify. And sometimes you may never get it more than it's a fungi, um, just because there's very specific things that tell one fungi from another. And you sometimes don't think to take pictures of them. And sometimes you can't take pictures of them because it might not be the right time of the year or the right um, part of growing for that particular fungi. So do the best you can. The option of last resort, if you really aren't sure what to call it, you can leave it blank. You can put it in as unknown. But most of the time, we can get it to some level of category like this. It's a plant. It's a, you know, it's a tree. It's a flower. Um, it's an insect. 
and get it to that. And if you can get it lower than that, like it's a butterfly or it's a bee, then that's even better. And you can pick those high level observations. And I mentioned this a couple of times, but if, if iNaturalist is really stumped, a lot of the times it's because it's not a great picture. Um, and so taking better pictures can help. Um, one is to make sure that you take multiple angles and get close enough and make, thing, make sure things are in focus. So um, this is an example that I have here for the multiple angles. This is a tree. So it was a tree in flower. So I've got the buds and the branches because it doesn't really have leaves yet. They're not out. I've got the flowers themselves. And then I've got the bark of the tree. And that is going to be uh, much more identifiable to iNaturalist. If I put all three of those pictures together in an observation, then I can get an ID. Um, and same with other flowers, um, you know, sometimes flowers are uh, easily identifiable just from the flower. Sometimes you might need the stem and some of the leaves. So sort of train yourself to try to take pictures of all of those things, um, you know, and, and that will help iNaturalists make the right um, suggestions for species. Make sure all your metadata is accurate and complete. If you don't, you won't be able to move your, pro your observations to research grade. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and so having that complete metadata is really important. That means the location and the date, you know, and good pictures and stuff. If you're taking pictures of captive or cultivated items, you know, please mark them as such. And then submit multiple observations if your photo contains more than one species. And we did that. So the bug and the flower are two different observations. I threw this picture in here um, of the tohi on the ground. This is so <laughs> this is one way that you can make it somewhat easier on yourself sometimes um, for uploading stuff. Sometimes working in the app to just get stuff in there really quick can can work really well. But if you're taking pictures with your DSLR, you, you know, now you've got things on a memory card and like for iPhone users anyway, that's really difficult to make those things talk sometimes. So for literally what I do sometimes is I take a picture of the picture at the back of my camera. Um, so on my screen on the back of my camera, this is a picture of that with my phone. And then I use that to upload to iNaturalist. And as long as you do that where you are, this is another really good way that I sometimes do this when I'm in um, a location that's not familiar to me. So like when I was on that Texas trip, for example, I could have taken a picture of the back of my camera with my phone. And now that picture is geotagged and I can copy that location to all of my other photos when I upload them since my big camera doesn't do that for me. Um, but again, that's just a little, you know, tip in there. Um, okay. I'm going to come back to the questions here. So. So yes, this will be recorded. Um, it will be on our uh, YouTube channel um, within a week. Um, when we add a picture and a person says what they think we observed, are they professionals or random people? Hold that thought. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, they're both, actually, to answer it in a short way. Um, they are both. So oh, editing location is good. OK. Uh, if we have pictures from the past, which we can date and location identify, should we add them to the app? Absolutely. Um, I've done that. All of my Texas pictures were from, um, I think, possibly even before the app existed uh, or was in its very early infancy. Uh, and I didn't even know about it. And so I've gone back through a lot of my photos um, from traveling to other places because I do pictures of birds and uh, butterflies and things like that. So yes, absolutely. If you have stuff that you can date and location identify, you can put it in the app. Um, and that's really the, the key component to it. You have to be able to put a date to it and you have to be able to um, identify the location. So this next section is sort of a little bit more technical, but it's this idea of this is kind of the behind the scenes of how it's working when you actually put your information in. And I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, um, just in the interest of time, but I do want to make sure that you understand this because this is personally something that I really struggled with when I started using this app. So the idea is um, you want to get stuff to research grade. 
and that's this green tag that literally says research grade. And you saw when I added stuff onto the website, it says needed ID and it had a yellow tag. And that's the first level at which you put things in. And all your observations start as casual. So if you put in something that doesn't have a date, doesn't have a location, um, it's just a casual observation. It becomes needs ID when it has a date, has a location, has a sound or a photo, um, and is not of a captive or cultivated organism. So this is the key. If you put in captive or cultivated organisms, they're never going to go beyond needs ID. They will never move to research grade um, because that's not the goal of the app, right? right? It's, it's to capture the stuff wild in the habitat. So everything goes in as casual. If you have to look up the location later or, you know, you are putting in a placeholder because you want to upload a photo for some reason that's on something, not your phone, then, you know, you can make that casual observation. But once you add all the stuff, then it goes to needs ID. The next section is research grade. And the formal definition of research grade is when the community agrees on a species level ID or lower. When more than two out of three of the identifiers agree on a taxon. And I know that sounds confusing, but two important things to remember. Whoops, sorry, we're jumping ahead. Okay, two important things to remember, species level and two out of three. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about taxonomy. Don't worry, we're not going back to high school science. But I put the chart here to show you, you know, we're going kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. iNaturalist wants to get every observation to the species level, if it possibly can. So it crowdsources those identifications. And so the most specific identification takes precedence. So if you have something that people have agreed, two out of three people have agreed that it's this species, then that's what iNaturalist counts it as. If two out of three species agree on a family, it might still say needs identification because it hasn't gotten to those species level. So, and if you enter the generic identification, like we talked about a bird or a butterfly, you will see the community work to make that ID more specific. And it really is, it's a combination of professionals and lay people that do the identifications. Um, but I don't want you to think that because people aren't, most people are very good about only identifying things they're familiar with. So for me, I'll look through the things that come in for our area if they haven't been identified. And if they're birds and it's a halfway decent picture, I'm fairly comfortable suggesting an identification. Um, but if it's a mushroom, I'm gonna let an expert do that. Uh, and so it might not be identified for a while. But there are experts out there. There are people who are, you know, really, really good at mushrooms. Even if that's not what they do for a living, that's what they study, you know, kind of like I do birds. They do mushrooms. And so things get identified. Um, and there's a lot of people using the system. So don't let it worry you that it's not an expert necessarily identifying it because most of the users of it are really good about um, only working in areas that they're familiar with and don't identify things or, you know, confirm identifications for stuff that they're not familiar with. And you'll see if you like take a look through iNaturalist, you will see there is a lot of stuff that's not identified. And a lot of times it's because it's really bad pictures. And so people can't say for sure that that's what it is because the picture is not good enough. So that's one of those things about getting really good pictures will help you get to this identification and research grade. So this is a specific example of an observation from my um, iNaturalist account that has gotten to research grade and it went there the easiest way. I put this information in, iNaturalist suggested that it was a silver spotted skipper. I, I selected that and said, yep, I agree, that's a silver spotted skipper and that's how it went into the system. One more person, came in and said, yep, I agree with you and iNaturalist that that's a silver spotted skipper. 
And so now it's moved to research grade because I have two out of three people at a, at a species level who agree completely. And the third person really doesn't matter because you will get people after the fact years later. I, in fact, when I went to my page, the top observation that was showing was from California and something that I literally up to, uploaded years ago and was lacking in identification. And somebody finally identified it and agreed and now moved it to research grade. So sometimes it can take a while. Sometimes it can happen really, really fast. Um, so this is the simplest way. You pick something that's a species level and somebody agrees with you that that's the species, you're done. It's a research grade. Um, other people might identify it as well, but once it's at research grade, um, it's there unless somebody really disagrees and then it moves back down to needs identification. So that's the simplest way. Um, you put something in at a species and they agree and so now it's, it's identified as research grade. The second way is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I have to get my notes for this because I have to say this the right way. Okay, so say there is a user named Adrienne Four, and she posts this picture to iNaturalist. And she makes an observation, and it's got a date, and it's got a location, and it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this exercise what that location is. But she puts this in, and she identifies it at the very, very high level of insects. And that's where she leaves it, okay? Which is not wrong, but iNaturalist wants to move it to a species level. It wants to get as specific as it possibly can. So it's gonna mark this as needs identification. And so then some other people are gonna go in and look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, I agree that's an insect, she's right. But Bee Bunny says, well, yeah, it's an insect, but it's a ladybird beetle. So I'm going to take it to that. I'm going to suggest that as an identification. And this all happens in that, that page of your observation. And Bee Bunny says it's a ladybird beetle. Now, what happens is it's still going to say insects, and it's still going to say needs identification because while we have two people verifying this, they don't agree at what it is. The first one put it in at this high level insect, the second one put it in as ladybird beetles. So it's going to stay as insect until somebody else comes along and sort of breaks the tie. So <laughs> this picture needs another level, but let's just go with it. What happens in the scenario that I naturally suggest is that Adrienne four who made the original identification goes back in and says to be bunny oh yeah i agree that's a ladybird beetle and i'm going to identify it as a three-banded ladybird so now the id would move to ladybird beetle and it would still want an identification because it's not to the species level yet and those two don't agree one's saying three-banded one's just saying ladybird so they still don't agree two out of three Three other people come along and say, no, it's not a three-banded ladybird beetle, it's a seven-spotted ladybird. And three people agree, so now we've reached the two out of three and we're at the species level of identification. So it will now go to research grade and be considered identified um, as far as iNaturalist is concerned. And I know that this is a little bit confusing and a lot of times this happens behind the scene scenes and until you go onto the website and start looking like you'll see the notifications you'll see like a little flag that says oh yeah you've got 12 notifications and that's just people agreeing with the identification and and i have to say this is the thing that confused me the most about iNaturalist when i started using it i would enter an iNat uh, you know an observation and iNaturalist would suggest an id that i knew was correct you know like the silver spotted skipper or a bird and I couldn't be, understand why people were IDing something that I knew what it was. And iNaturalist like showed me the right thing, so it knew what it was. But iNaturalist doesn't know what I know, so it needs someone to agree with me before it you know, counts or moves to research grade. Now, just because something doesn't move to research grade doesn't mean it's gonna go away. It's still gonna be in iNaturalist, it's still gonna be in your account, it's just gonna have a flag that says needs ID. Um, for some projects, you know, that can be, um, it won't be included. Uh, for my projects, I'm taking everything, so that's fine. Um, and we'll work to, you know, get to that, 
species level identification um, as best we can. So again, sometimes this goes on behind the scenes. Sometimes, you know, you'll get people who will make comments and say, you know, I don't think this is a three-banded ladybird because, and show you why, you know, your identification was wrong um, in the first place. And that can be really helpful sometimes and like key you in on things to look at um, for certain species um, for the future. But again, you only have to interact with that part of the system as much as you want. You know, you can look at the, the people that are uh, making identifications for you um, or confirming your identifications. You can just let it go on in the background, which to be honest, most of the time, that's what I do. Um, I really don't pay much attention to it at all. Um, unless something pops up that I think is really, really weird and somebody like changed an identification that I was really sure of, then I'll go in and look at that observation and see what they're saying and if they have a reason why they changed it um, or not. And, and you have an option to agree or disagree with people that, you know, make identifications um, for you or, you know, in your observations. So it's a, it is a community-based system and it works really, really well. Um, it's not perfect, but most of the time it functions just like it should. Um, without you having to do any work other than uploading your identifications. Likewise, if you are somebody who is really knowledgeable about a specific taxon, you know, if you're a birder, if you're really into mushrooms, um, you can go on and just search in the observations and like you can add all these filters. Like, so for me, what I do if I'm going to go identify birds for people is I limit it to the eastern United States and I only want birds that aren't identified and then I'll go through and see if I can help identify any of those and move them to research grade and so if you're really knowledgeable in an area about plants or insects or mushrooms you know you can do that as well and that's a really useful way um, to use iNaturalist maybe you don't want to go out and make a lot of observations in the field but you're perfectly happy to help people identify stuff on the back end in an area where you're really knowledgeable and you can absolutely use it that way and sometimes you can't get there. Um, this is an observation that I made, um, well, not that long ago, but it still hasn't been identified. I know it's a moth. It's a, and the person, oops, the person agreed with me at the family level, but it still needs ID, even though there's two of us, because it's not to the species level yet. So maybe it'll get there sometime. Maybe I need to go look for a project. Um, and, and this is what you can do. You can do nothing which is pretty much what I've done right now, that's fine. You can just leave it there. And, and eventually maybe somebody will come along that will be able to identify um, that particular caterpillar. Um, you can go look for a project that contains your observation. So I'm pretty sure that this is a moth caterpillar. So I could go look for a moth or butterfly moth type project that's taking caterpillar pictures and enter it into the project. And what happens then is if it's a project that you have to enter specifically, you know, put your observation in, most of the time it's experts that are running that project. So they're gonna look at your observation before they accept it into the project. And nine times out of 10, they're probably going to ID it. Or if they can't ID it before they put it in, somebody else in the project can probably ID it. So, if you have something that sits for a long, long time without being able to be identified, you can try to look for a project that contains what you think it is and put it in that project and see if they can identify it. So that's, those are really you know, your only two options at that point. Do nothing or try to find an expert. Um, one comment that I wanted to make really quickly, iNaturalist works um, on the idea of everything being shared. So generally speaking, um, it, it has what they consider an open geo privacy. So anyone can see the specific location that you're putting things in. You can obscure things, partially obscure them. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do that, just a general sort of obscuring and or private. Um, if you're doing stuff from your house and you don't want people to know like exactly your house, you can do this obscured level of geo privacy. And like, if you're doing things on the website, 
that's where you can sort of batch do that as well, like we did with the location, basically select all your photos. And then you can just, I think there's just a click box on the left hand side that you can obscure the location if you need to. <clears throat> and that's really for things that are, you know, um, either very, very, very private locations you could do completely hidden. Um, that's less useful to the system. It makes it more difficult for the system to understand exactly where you are. But obscuring them um, can help if you don't want to, you know, show your exact house street or something like that. Um, iNaturalist will automatically obscure um, species that are in there as rare or threatened. Um, and that happens automatically because it doesn't want people to know exactly where they are. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, most of the time open works, uh, you know, if you're out on our preserves and you know just out in general nature and not doing things from your home um, the default is this open geo privacy and that's fine because nothing that we're doing out there is, is private and it doesn't matter where exactly it comes from okay last section here so i'm going to see if there's any questions um so yeah um it's it's a cool program i mean i'm i'm obsessed with it it is really hard for me to take a walk and just like hiking walk, I have to stop and I naturalist things. So um, my walks tend to be rather slow and rather meandering because I'm constantly distracted by things that I want to take a picture of to put an iNaturalist. So um, it can be quite addicting sometimes. So last section is just a little bit about um, how you can participate. I mean, absolutely you can go participate anytime, anywhere along the way. Um, and I'm going to be harvesting those results um, and analyzing them, creating species lists and all those kinds of things um, on the back end that we're using here at the organization um, to understand our habitats, our preserves. Um, are we seeing new things because we've made changes? We've added, you know, tree species or flower species. And is that attracting something new? And that's the kind of thing that long term we're hoping to be able to understand better by using the data that you guys are helping us collect. So that's really you know, a big part of it. But there's a couple bigger things that you can help participate in. One is um, City Nature Challenge. And this City Nature Challenge is something that is global. It runs um, all over the world and it's cities, cities are defined by however the city wants to be defined. So for us, Philly, is defined as all of these counties. So it's basically any county that touches Philadelphia. Um, and part of the reason why is because geographically uh, as a city, Philadelphia is rather small compared to some other cities throughout the world. Uh, think of LA or um, things like that. You know, there's a lot of much bigger cities. So from a sort of leveling the competitiveness of it and also Philadelphia is really, really urban which adds its own set of challenges. There is certainly nature in urban areas, but it is more limited. It may be more difficult to find. And so when the organizers of the Philly City Nature Challenge set up the geographic bounds, they added all of these counties. So if you are anywhere in Bucks, uh, Montgomery, Philadelphia, the three counties in New Jersey, Chester, like all of those, you can enter observations during this time period. So it's the weekend of Friday, April 30th to Monday, May 3rd. And that's when you can take your pictures. When you actually can upload after that, as long as the geotag date is during that time. So you can, you know, do, do your pictures and upload everything on Tuesday, for example, if you really want to. Um, you run out of time on Monday or whatever. You can certainly upload them as you go along. And then there's an ID period that runs for the next week. And the idea is, is that this is sort of a competitive kind of a thing against cities. Now, in 2020, because of COVID, they dropped the competitive aspect of it. And they're kind of doing that again in 2021. Obviously, COVID's not done. Uh, there's slightly lessened restrictions. You know, We can do things a little bit more as a group if we wanted to. Again, with social distancing, um, there are events going around um, for the City Nature Challenge. So if you go to this website, the CNC, cncphilly.org, there are events that happen. So you could like go join a walk or go to a particular preserve and they'll be like, here, go, go, I naturalist this preserve for us. 
we're not doing any events for Wasek and Trails this year because City Nature Challenge falls the same time as our Birdathon. And so it makes it really difficult for us to do events. Um, but you can go out on your own for sure to any of our preserves during this time and put in observations and they will count towards Philly's collective total um, for this. And I have to say, so in, we've done this sort of as a big Philly thing for two years, 2019 and 2020. And in 2019, we finished overall in the world, 23rd in observation, no, excuse me, 23rd in observers. So the number of people participating, 24th in species and 16th in observers out of a total of 159 cities. 16th in observations, sorry, 159 cities total. Um, if you take the city size that we are, so uh, with an area between 5,000 and 10,000 square kilometers, that's how they measure the, the one category of cities. We actually finished in 2019, second in observations, third in species and second in observers. And we lost to Cape Town, South Africa. So there is a great competitive spirit among those of us who have participated in City Nature Challenge before to beat South Africa, which is gonna be really hard, but we really wanna do it. Um, in 2020, we definitely, we increased observers to 23,675. We had 820 different people uploading to um, iNaturalist during that time period in 2020. So for 2021, I want to see if we can get even more than 820 people. So even if you go only out and do it for an hour and you only make five observations, whatever, that all counts um, towards those numbers. So I encourage you at some point during these four days to try to get out there uh, and make some observations and you know practice what you learned here tonight. The next thing is very similar. This is very specific to us. So the idea of bioblitzes, and this is really sort of, the idea is usually just to collect as many species as you can within a designated location and a time period. Usually they're 24 hours. Because of COVID, we're doing ours as a week and targeting these five preserves to try to collect more information on. If you remember way back my slide of, you know, what we have information on, um, we're missing information for a lot of these preserves, for Pezac, Briar Hill, and Willow Lake doesn't have a ton of observations, Dodsworth needs more. Four Mills has a bunch, but if you look at the specific ones we have, we have a lot of the same things, um, because it's really easy to take pictures of like the spring flowers, for example. So there's a lot of those kinds of pictures in there. There's tons of pictures of poison ivy, um, those types of things. So we wanna try to document as much as we can. There is a loads more information on our website about this. Um, I will say, so we're running one of these each season. We ran one in March. We didn't have a whole lot of people participating. Um, again, it's hard to promote it because there's not really a walk associated with it. Now that things are, you know, slightly less restricted, more people are vaccinated, we're moving into that, doing more in person. So for this week in June, pay attention to our website and our social media mailings and things like that, because I'm probably gonna set up a couple of walks specifically as part of this bio blitz. So I'll be at PZAC Preserve, for example, maybe you know Sunday afternoon from four to six, and you can come out and join me. And this will be an, op an opportunity to you know sort of I naturalist with somebody else, with a group of other people, we'll spread out and kind of all go our own ways and then meet up at the end and sort of, you know, chat through what people found, um, those kinds of things. So I'm looking at putting together the schedule for that. So again, keep your eyes peeled for that. And if you're interested in coming out in a distanced masked group setting, um, we will be looking at doing that for June. And then we will do it, be doing it again in September and um, sometime in either late November, early December, um, working around Thanksgiving. So um, maybe more mid-November um, to get a, win a more winter one in place. Um, I do wanna mention really quick, uh, if you have young kids, there is an app called Seek. It's also by iNaturalist. You can put it on your phone. You do not have to have an account for this one. It uses observations that have been made in iNaturalist to create challenges for wherever you're located. So you have to have location services turned on on your phone, but then it will like give you sort of like a challenge to go find this species. 
Um, and you can learn more about the species that are in there. You can earn badges, there's monthly challenges. And again, it's more sort of exploration and learning based and sort of more kid friendly than the iNaturalist app can be um, in and of itself. If you have an iNaturalist account, you can link to that. Uh, it's more of a manual thing. You sort of have to manually upload your observations um, at the end, but you can make observations through Seek and the Seek app and make them connect to iNaturalist. This is not something that I've used a lot. Um, I, you know, I know it's out there. I know people that have used it. It works fairly well. It is relatively new, so it does have a little bit more of a learning curve, I think, um, than the iNaturalist app itself. Um, but again, if you're, you know, if you need a direction, especially if you're working with kids and you want to say, you know, here, this is some suggestions, go find this species. Um, this can be a really good way to do that. So this is the end of my information. And I'm going to look here and see if there's any other questions. OK. Uh, somebody has a picture for mammals. Do, do they want pictures of scat? It's not so much a matter of wanting, but you can absolutely use pictures of scat for uh, presence of an animal. Um, just like the beaver chewing the tree or tracks or something like that. Um, so, you know, perfectly, absolutely acceptable. Um, oh, somebody asks, would this be great to use during the birdathon? So, yes, yes. Um, if you're somebody that takes pictures of birds, for sure, um, because birds are often a thing that's lacking. If you're not something that somebody that's taking pictures of birds per se, you could certainly either try to sound record them when you're there, because that counts, or you can, you know, you see a butterfly when you're out there looking for birds during the birdathon, or you see flowers, or you know, you're passing trees and stuff like that. You can absolutely um, take pictures and do that. I would probably suggest um, the approach of taking the pictures while you're in the field during the birdathon, but not so much worrying about uploading them to iNaturalist until the birdathon's done. Um, only from a time perspective, because I know I'm, I'm very competitive about the birdathon, so I know when I'm out there, I'm trying to focus on the birds. Uh, but it is absolutely um, something that you can do anytime you're in the field. Um, you can capture those pictures as you're going along, you're standing there watching a bird, you're waiting for you know, something to start singing, and you capture a picture of the trees, the flowers around you, for sure. Um, you know, you get home that night and upload them to iNaturalist then. So um, lots of different ways to use it. And, um, you know, I really encourage you to get out there and do it. it. It is something that will really, really help us on the back end um, understand what's out there. So uh, it's a really great opportunity um, to have, you know, people who are out on the trails all the time helping us collect this information. So uh, you can see the upcoming events here, all the details on our website. There's even more events um, that wouldn't fit on here on the website. There's a bunch of hikes. Some of them are full, some of them aren't. There may be new ones coming. So keep your eyes open. Uh, and like I said, there'll be um, stuff on the website about the um, group walks for the bio blitzes in June. Um, so hope to see you there. Um, maybe you'll participate in Philly City Nature Challenge. And if there are no more questions, that is all I have for tonight. So um, I hope everybody has a good evening. And uh, again, within a week, this will be up on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and refer to it if you need the how-to. And please, if you have any questions, you run into any problems um, when you're trying to use it, it's not working, reach out to me via email and I will ha be happy to um, help you figure out what's going wrong because I want this to be a pleasant experience for you. So thanks everybody and uh, have a really good night.